Bobber's men had marched to Kanwa disheartened by defeat in patrol actions, terrified by stories of Rajput courage, astrologers' predictions of bad luck, and weakened by the desertion of frightened allies. On the contrary, Rana's men were full of confidence, having defeated the enemy in every military action that had taken place, inflicting heavy damages without taking much losses. The two massive armies were to clash decisively on that fateful day of 17 March, 1527. Mughal sources estimate the Rajput numbers to be over 2 lakhs and limit theirs at less than 15,000. Modern estimates, however, put Rajput army between 60 to 80,000, with around 500 war elephants, and Mughal army at over 30,000. Rana Sangha commanded a unified army of Rajputana alongside his Afghan allies. Less than half were mounted, and rest were on foot. Bulk of the Mughal army was made up of its famous Turkic heavy cavalry, some 20,000 in strength, supplemented by foot musketeers and their Indian allies. Babur also had one mortar at Bayana, which was forged only six months ago, and numerous field guns. Rajput army was arranged in its traditional formation, comprising a center consisting of a vanguard and a rear guard, a right and a left. Chieftains of Mewar were posted in the center alongside Rana who was in the rear guard on his war elephant. Rajput and Afghan allies made Rana's left and right flanks. There were war elephants in the front line. Mughal forces were drawn in three lines. In the first line, the baggage carts, probably a thousand, were placed, tied together. Between every two carts, five or six movable shields, fixed to wheeled tripods, were placed behind which the musketeers sheltered when firing. Openings were left at distances of about 60 yards for a few hundred horsemen to set out. The mortar, field guns and foot musketeers formed the second line behind the carts. In the third line stood the regular heavy cavalry. The cavalry was formed into three main divisions, the right, under Humayu, 5,000 strong, the left, around 3,000, and the center, under Babur about 10,000 strong, with his own detachable left and right flanks. The Indian allies of Babur were posted on his left. In addition to these, there were two bodies of cavalry around 1,000 each, posted at the extreme ends of the two wings, for outflanking the enemy in a pincer movement. The Rajput plan was to overwhelm the enemy with wave after wave of relentless attacks using their sheer numbers, whereas, the Mughal plan was to sit tight and continue musket fire and stone hurling till the enemy was decimated and worn out, and then to assume the offensive. The fighting started at around 10 in the morning with a charge of the Rajput center. As the Rajputs rushed towards Mughal center in a vast crowd, they saw a sudden flash, like lightning, subsequently a loud thunder, and ultimately a huge stone came hurtling through the air like a meteor, which hit the vast sea of soldiers and crushed everything in its path. Even the elephants could not stand before it. Those Rajputs who were left unscathed in the front were hit by musket bullets. It was unheard of. The Rajputs now probed the Mughal wings, driving their elephants in front. The first impact was on the Mughal right, and it nearly broke. Babur instantly dispatched reinforcements which relieved the pressure and enabled the Mughal right to launch a counter-attack, which pushed the Rajput left back almost to the back of its own center. The Rajputs attacked again. But, this time, Babur's foot musketeers opened fire upon them. Simultaneously, the Mughal left was charged by the Rajput right. Here also fierce fighting took place, and each side reinforced its men. In the end Mughal left strengthened by additions from its vanguard, counter-charged and penetrated as far as the Rajput rear. But at this stage, the pincer movement was not completed, and Babur's men rode back to their own posts. The superior numbers of the Rajputs and their fierce fighting nature prevented the Mughals from turning their flanks by the pincer movement. More and more troops were sent from Mughal center to meet the Rajput pressure on this wing which was originally very weak. 
In the center, the Rajputs continued to fall without being able to retaliate or gain some advantage. They were hopelessly outclassed in weaponry, and their large numbers only increased the probability of their being hit by bullets. Still, they continued fighting. This to and fro fighting continued till noon, when Babur decided to assume the offensive. He let loose his main cavalry so far kept in reserve behind the carts. They came out of the Mughal center through the openings left on the line of carts and fell on the Rajput center from two sides. Next the foot musketeers also came out and attacked the Rajputs in front, creating havoc at close range. This made Rana desperate. He jumped into the thick of the fighting. As he rode between the columns he received a wound from an arrow. His guards flew to his relief, and he was taken away from the battle in an unconscious condition. His collapse was concealed by the inner circle of the Rajput commanders, who continued the fight with a counterfeit Sangha seated on the royal elephant. For a time under this new command the Rajput soldiers continued the action with the same vigor, of course, not knowing the departure of Sangha. But when the reports of his possible absence started circulating, confusion and chaos ensued. Sensing confusion in Raj Rajput tranks, the Mughal wheeled artillery was advanced, and Babur himself followed them with his entire center. Fierce fighting took place for about an hour, and steadily the Rajputs were pushed back, and most of their captains who had rushed to the front, fell. As absence of Rana became apparent, the unifying force was broken, and a mass desertion soon followed. At this point a Rajput chief, commanding about 6,000 men, switched sides. The remnants of the Rajput army dispersed, leaving many wounded and dead behind. The rout was sudden and total. Countless bodies of Rajputs and their allies filled the road as far as Bayana. The victors marched into the Rana's camp. But he was nowhere to be found, and no further pursuit was possible after the long and tiring battle. Soon, daylight also failed. Next day, the field was surveyed, and a list of Mughal martyrs was prepared from the heaps of dead bodies lying on the road from Kanwa to Bayana. A tower of skulls was raised near the camp to commemorate the great victory. Babur assumed the title of Ghazi. After the battle Babur advanced and took possession of Bayana. His plan of continuing the campaign against Sangha had to be abandoned for the time being due to the approaching summer. He captured Chandari in the beginning of 1528, but no further expansion against Mewar was possible. Meanwhile, Sangha had recovered from his wounds and had not given up. From contemporary local legends as well as Muslim records, it appears that he was preparing for another contest with Babur. But he died soon at the comparatively early age of 46, allegedly poisoned by his own people, who did not want him to wage further war. And that's how one of the fiercest and bravest warrior in history met his tragic demise. This battle was, certainly not the last, but the harbinger of the Hindu resistance that the mighty Mughals would have to face in the future. We will be covering those battles in detail and will be retelling many more stories of such brave men and their valor. Let us know in the comments section which incidents, battles or empires would you like us to cover in the upcoming videos. Also, please like, subscribe, comment and share the videos to support us. Until next time.